that's kind of what Paul or the writer, we don't know if it was Paul, the writer of Hebrews was telling the Hebrew people, you need to run to Christ when they were going through some great trials and difficulties and hardships, because many of them were saying, I think I'm going to run back to Judaism. I think I'm going to run back to the synagogue. I think I'm going to run back to the temple. And the whole book of Hebrews is reminding them, no, 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 run to Christ. Run to Christ, because he's your answer. He's your solution. And so we pick up in verse 15 this morning, and it, it's strange because he begins by, and for this cause, which... Of course, you all remember exactly what we talked about last week. We're in the middle of the chapter, and for this cause, you're immediately running back to exactly what we talked about last week. Amen? Amen. You heard me, right? But just in case you weren't here, everybody else remembers, but if you weren't here, he was reminding us back in chapter 9, the first 14 verses, that Jesus wants to make, he wants us to make him the central hub of our lives. That in all that we do, because of all that he has done for us, he's reminding us that we should center our lives around him. That he should be the focal point of who we are and what we do, and, and that should be our perspective. Uh, maybe I'll share a brief thing I read this week that, um, that uh, you, you're going to be upset with me, but um, how could you not root for Mr. Purdy, the 49ers quarterback? Because he said this week, that he said, my identity is not in being a quarterback in the NFL, but my identity is in the fact that I'm a child of God and my relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's root for him today. Amen. Amen. Well, I will be. Nobody else will be. But, uh, but again, that should be, doesn't matter who you are, that should be our identity. My identity is in Jesus Christ. Right? And so we should all have that focal point. So, so we should live in that verses 1 to 14, then you get to verses 15 to 28, and here we get Jesus' last will and testament. I don't know if you have a will. I hope you have a will. If you're married, you should have a will, because your family needs to know what to do once you die and shouldn't have struggles with what goes on after we die. So we should have a will, and here's the thing. Did you know that Jesus had a will? When Jesus died, he left us his will, and he reminds us of what that will was all about. So look at verse 15. He says this, and for this cause, he, Jesus, is the mediator or executor of the new will, the new covenant, the new testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first will, the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, where a will is, there must of necessity be the death of the testator, the will maker. For a testament or a will is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator, the one who made the will, lived. Lord, as we come before you today, as we, as we think about the will that you wanted to enact for us because of your death, burial, and resurrection, Lord, we know it speaks about where we go when we die, but it speaks about so much more than that. And I pray, Lord, as your people, we would do our best to honor and glorify Jesus Christ, as you tell us, whether by life or by death. May we be faithful. May we, as we saw last week, center our lives around you and allow you to be king of our heart. So, Lord, teach us this morning what it is that you want us to do because of what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So in verse 15, he says this, and for this cause, he, Jesus, is the mediator, he is the executor of the new covenant, the new will, that by means of death, that he died, why did he die? Look at the end of the verse, for the redemption, for the loosing, for the payment of my sins that were under the first testament, that were under the first law. And so he reminds us that Jesus left you if you're saved, if you're a child of God, he left you in his will. 
And it's a great truth that he left us in his will. And he tells us what he wanted to give us. We've, we've seen a lot of things. We're joint heirs with Christ. He, we saw some of the things that we're going to get in heaven in Sunday school this morning. That we're going to have no more tears, no more sickness, no more sorrow. And every child of God gets all of that. We, we experience the, the fullness of heaven. But Jesus Christ not only died, but he came back to be the executor. If you have a will, you typically write in your will that this person is the one who is supposed to carry out the duties of the will. It's kind of in court, all of that kind of stuff, but there's one that has made the executor. Here's the thing. Jesus not only died for you and left you in his will, he came back and he said, by the way, I'm the executor. I get to dish out what I've already promised you. So it's an amazing thing. So nobody can be confused of, did he mean this or that? He's the executor of the will as well. And he did that so that he could redeem us, loose us from our sins, and give us fullness of joy in heaven. But he goes on. Look at verse number 16. For where a testament is, where a will is, there must of necessity be the death of the testator. And so he reminds us there that God says that in order for the will to be enacted, the person has to die. Now, if just, for instance, my kids stumble across our will, and they see the will, and they're like, I'm going to go to probate court today. And they take that will down to probate court, and they're at probate court, and the judge is there, and they're like, hey, we want to split up all the inheritance today. And the judge is like, well, everything looks in order in the will, everything's good, and he says, um, do, you have the, do you have the death certificate? They're like, well, he hasn't died yet. The judge goes, well, you can't enact the will until he's dead, and they say, yeah, but we just want all the stuff now. The judge would say, no, you can't come back till he's dead, and don't go kill him, because then you'll be in prison. But you understand that the will doesn't take place until the person has died. And here's the great truth. Jesus died, but he rose again. He's living. But he did die so he could enact his will, the new covenant, the new testament, and he tells us what he wants to do with that. And so he reminds us of verse number 17 for a testament. A will is in force after men, after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. So if you have a will, it does no good to anybody while you're alive. Which is why we make the will. Because after we're gone, the court has to decide who gets what, and it needs to be intact, and it needs to be done. Wording is, I being of sound mind and of good judgment, you know. And so that's the idea. And so Jesus, here's the thing. Jesus was of sound mind and good judgment. Hard to understand when he chose you and me. He was a sound mind, and he saw everything I would be, and he still said, I'm going to put him in my will. I'm going to make him a child of God. I'm going to give him everything. I'm going to bless him for all of eternity. And we should stop and say, wow. Because we probably wouldn't have chose us. But he did, and he knew all the details about who we were, and yet he still chose to put us in his will. Look at what he says in verse 18. Whereupon, neither the first testament, the first will, was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves, and of goats, with water, and scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book, the commandments, and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the New Testament, which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry and almost all things are by law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission, there's no forgiveness, there's no dealing with our sin problem. 
And so when Jesus left us in his will, he, he wanted to remind us that, yes, he died, he was buried, he rose again. And he says, let me take you back to the Old Testament. Re remember what Moses did under the first covenant, under the Mosaic covenant. What had to happen to have fellowship, to have a relationship with Jesus, with the coming Messiah, we know now, now as Jesus. But in order to have that relationship with God, what did they have to do? Well, they had to kill the animals and spread the blood and sprinkle it and do all of that. But the blood of bulls and goats didn't take away sin. But God said, this is what I'm going to do temporarily. This doesn't cover your sins completely. But I'm going to accept this as long as by faith you're looking forward to the Messiah that will one day take away sin. Blood of bulls and goats can never do that. But that's the plan until... And he didn't say it in these words, until God's will is enacted at the cross. When he will, God himself will die for your sins. He's going to rise again the third day. He didn't tell him all that, those details, but he's going to die. He's going to rise again, and he's going to reign forever and ever. This one man forever can deal with our sins. Why? Because he's God. He's God in the flesh. And so... Moses, from that time, they're sprinkling blood, and blood is just flowing. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. He was all looking forward to the Messiah. But he put it in his will that when he died and rose again, he could say, it's finished, and now I can hand out all that I want to give for my people of all time. Again, we're in his will, right? He's given us this. We inherit all good things. However, here's the thing. When you have a will, and if you have a will, you can put some stipulations in your will. Dave Ramsey says all the time, and he's a multi, multi, multi-millionaire. And he says this, every year I sit down with my children. I think he's got four children. And he said, I sit down with them every year, and we go over the will. And every year I tell them, if you ever start doing illegal drugs, you're out of the will. It's kept his kids from doing illegal drugs. <laughs> right, because they want to inherit. They also want to glorify God. But they want to inherit what he has. Leona Helmsley left her dog $12 million. And two of her grandchildren, she cut out of the will completely. And she said, they know why. <laughs> and then her other two grandchildren, they get a portion of the inheritance once a year when they go visit their father's graveside and they have to sign a register book. She was a little eccentric. $12 million to a dog. I don't get that. But, you know, we can put stipulations in our will, and that's okay because that was Leona Helmsley's money. She can do with whatever she wants. Even after the grave, she can do with whatever she wants with her money. And she can stipulate, this is what you can and can't do and can and can't get, and certain people can get certain things. And Jesus did the same thing. Now, for every child of God, we all get heaven forever. But he did put some stipulations in his will. Look at verse number 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, with the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And if you remember, he talked last week, I've just been talking through the whole book, about the fact that what Moses had set up on the earth, the tabernacle, eventually the temple, it, it all was a shadow of what was really in heaven. That God has this in essence, a tabernacle in heaven where we fellowship with God through this and, and it's perfect in heaven. This was just temporary, which is why he's warning the Hebrews, why would you go back to the temporary when it's been fulfilled through Jesus Christ? We don't need that. And so he reminds us all of this in heaven is better. Jesus is better. The, the fellowship with God is better. The tabernacle is better. Everything on earth was just temporary and not perfect. But we have something better waiting for us. Verse number 24. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands. So he didn't go into the earthly tabernacle. Which are a figure of the true. But into heaven 
itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. So Christ went into heaven, he appeared before God, and in essence, God the Father said to God the Son, your sacrifice was enough. It was enough to save me, and it was enough to save you. Nothing else needed to be added. It was totally perfect. But the stipulation for me to get to heaven was not just that God would die on the cross for my sins. There had to be more to that. Otherwise, everybody would go to heaven when they die. So he put a stipulation on it. The payment was made. Salvation is complete. But in order for anybody to embrace and be part of his will, I had to come to him by faith. I have to repent of my sin, recognize I'm a sinner, recognize I don't deserve heaven, I deserve hell because of my sin. I have to turn from that and have a desire to follow him. And I embrace Jesus Christ alone not Jesus and my good works, not Jesus and church, not Jesus and baptism, not Jesus and membership, not Jesus and anything. It's Christ alone turning from my sins, trusting in Christ alone for salvation. And once I did that, I was now part of the will of God. I was entered into his will, and I, I get heaven for all of eternity. And it's pretty simple. Yeah, it's so hard, right? So many people miss it. Because they say, well, it's got it's to be more difficult than that. It's, I, I, I think it has something to do with also going to church every week. And it has something to do with being a good person. And it has something to do with getting baptized. And, it, and God would say, well, then you're nullifying what I said. And you're out of the will. You can't embrace heaven. Because if you're trusting in anything but Jesus Christ alone, and not a head knowledge... A heart knowledge, where I've repented of my sin, and I've placed my faith in Christ alone. Then I'm saved forever. Nothing can change that. But he goes on, verse number 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. And again, some churches teach that. Every Sunday, we're coming together to re-sacrifice Jesus Christ. We've got to do it every week. In fact, every day, we have to re-sacrifice him. And what we're saying is, well, then I don't believe that he sacrificed once for all. I think there's a different way. I think we re-sacrifice God all the time, which nullifies the Bible. So either the Bible's right, or that false teaching is right. I'm sticking with the Bible. That God says he did it once. Salvation comes through one sacrifice for sins forever. Verse 26. For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared, is the word again, appeared, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. It's appointed unto man wants to die. Every person will die. We all know that. But then he says this, after we die, there's the judgment. Now the Bible talks about two different judgments. One is the great white throne judgment where all unbelievers will stand before God one day and everybody who's in that courtroom, they will get their judgment their sentence, and at the end of that sentence, they will all be ushered to eternity in the lake of fire. Because the great white throne judgment is for unbelievers, those who this side of heaven have said, I don't believe that Jesus is the only way we can get to heaven. And they've trusted in something else. And they may be completely faithful to their religion or their belief system, but if they're trusting in anything but Jesus Christ alone, they will spend eternity in the lake of fire. The other judgment is the judgment seat of Christ, where we receive, in fact, hold your place here, go back if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's look at it real quickly, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and at this judgment seat, this is where every child of God will stand, 
And here's the good news. It doesn't matter what happens at this judgment seat. You're only there because you're a child of God. And at the end of it, you get heaven forever. But he says something interesting here. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, he's not judging my sin at the judgment seat of Christ. Why is that? Because sin was dealt with where? At the cross. So he's not going to bring up my sin at the judgment seat of Christ. Because at the judgment seat of Christ, he's, he's there, in a sense, called the beam of seat. It, 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 he is giving out rewards. He's giving out blessings that we will enjoy for all of eternity. So I, I thought, I thought we all get heaven. Well, we do. We all get heaven. But there's this judgment seat that God is going to judge how we've lived, how I have responded in my life to serve God here on this planet. Now, it doesn't matter if you are the most faithful Christian who has ever lived or the most unfaithful Christian who's ever lived. We all get heaven. So then, why bother being a faithful Christian if we all get heaven? You ever struggle with that? You're like, well, this doesn't seem really right or fair. Like, why would God... So somebody can get saved, genuinely saved, not thought they were saved, but genuinely get saved and be a total train wreck of a Christian. You ever met some of those people? <laughs> and you're like, I don't even know if they're saved. Some of them are saved and they're a train wreck spiritually and they don't live for God, they live for self. They don't make Christ the center, they make them their center and they want God to do their bidding and they just get Christianity all wrong. But they're genuinely saved. When they die, guess what? They enjoy the fullness of of heaven, just like you and me. So why be faithful? I'm sure you've wrestled with that. Like this, something's not right here. But he says we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and receive what we've done in our body, good or bad. He tells us another place about some will receive gold and silver and some wood, hay, and stubble. The wood hand stubble is going to be burned up. You know, like, I'm not sure I really understand what's he talking about here. Now that I've confused you a little bit, go back to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 3. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse number 11. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Do you believe that? Do you believe that one day God is going to judge this world completely? We would all say, of course, it says in the Bible, one day God is going to destroy the world, create a new heaven and a new earth. Well, if we believe that, what does he tell us? Verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons are you obligated to be in all holy conversation and godliness? God expects you, and he says, you're obligated. If you're a child of God, you're obligated to live a holy life. Why? Because you know what the end is going to be for the world, for the unbeliever, for the Christian. Go to Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 23. Again, talking about the judgment of God. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. I will search your heart, God says. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But I thought we all get heaven. And I thought heaven is heaven for everybody. It is, in a sense. We'll get there. Ephesians chapter 6. 
Ephesians 6. But again, God seems to indicate that some people are going to get more rewards or more, it almost seems like more blessings in heaven. Because it's certainly not talking about earth. Ephesians 6, verse number 5. Servants, be obedient to them which are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. God says, I want you to do the will of God from the heart. You say, yeah, but you don't know my boss. God says, I don't care about your boss. I want you to do the will of God. I want you to serve your boss like you are serving me. Like, well, I can't do that. God says, well, I want, to, I want to honor you. I want to reward you one day. So serve your boss. Serve your government. Serve, you know, your local municipality. Serve other people. The people that you're around live with a right heart. Serve me from the heart. Verse 7, with goodwill, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord whether he be bond or free. God says this. Um, do you realize that the way you serve on this planet is how I'm going to bless you in heaven? But I thought heaven is heaven for everybody. It's a little confusing, isn't it? I think we got one more. Two more. Luke 19. Luke 19. Luke 19, verse 17. The wrong chapter. That's why it didn't look right to me. I'm in, now I'm in Luke 19. Luke 19, verse number 17, parable of the talents. You know this one. And he said unto him, well done, or well and he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Lord, thy pound gained five pounds. And he said unto him, Be thou over five cities. And he came to the saying, another came, saying, Lord, here is thy pound, which I have kept in a napkin, for I fear thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up what thou layest not down, and reapest which thou did not sow. And he said unto him, Out of the, thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up what I laid not down, and reaping what I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, and at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. And he said unto him that stood by, Take from him that pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you that unto every one which shall be given, and for him that hath not, every one that he hath shall be taken away from him. And again, that parable of the talents and the ten pounds, and, and the one has five, and the other one gets fired, and the one has, it's just, we sometimes struggle with what in the world is God doing with these promises that he's going to give to some more than others, but heaven is heaven for everybody. Um, there's a good illustration. God reminds us that as we serve him here on this planet, he says, I want you to serve me with all your heart. And sometimes we serve God with like this much, you know, a cup full. And we, we invest in God and we serve God with a cup full. And we, we do what we can, but not as much as we should. And, you know, we're like, I'm, I'm saved, but I'm a, I'm a half-hearted Christian. But I will do some stuff for God, and so we give God, you know, our cup full of stuff. God says something like this. When you get to heaven, I'm going to take that cup that you used to serve me, and then I'm going to dip it in all of my eternal blessings, and I'm going to let you have it for all of eternity. And then there's other people who take this 
And they serve God with their whole heart. And they pour their life into God and they make him the center of their life and they serve him to the best. They're not perfect, but they just, they really want to live for God. And I think in the judgment seat of Christ, God takes this out of our hand and says, let me dip this into the eternal blessings. Now, heaven's going to be heaven for everybody in the sense that I may be standing next to the Apostle Paul with this. He's going to have something like this or probably like a 50-gallon bucket. And I'm not going to be able to envy him because there's no envy in heaven. And I'm not going to be able to look at him and say, well, why does he get more than me? Because there's not going to be any of that in heaven. But God talks about even the millennial kingdom, there's going to be some that are going to be able to serve in various ways over much, and some will serve over little. But heaven's going to be heaven for everybody. But what we do now on this planet, God gives us the ability to invest and to send into heaven what he wants to bless us with. And sometimes we think about, well, it really doesn't matter what I do, because when I get to heaven, I get heaven. Just like you know, that guy that's really committed that I think is a little way out there, you know, like, why would you want to really invest your life into God on this planet when I get heaven? And I think there's that principle that God says, because I want to pour out my richest blessings for all eternity. Yeah, heaven's going to be heaven. There's not going to be any comparison. Nobody's going to look. Just remember the disciples, they're like, they didn't want to ask Jesus. They sent their mothers. They said, can, can you go ask Jesus if we, James and John, could, when we get to heaven, could we sit on his right hand? Could we, like, be the closest to him? Because I think Peter's gunning for that. So could you, like, go ask him? Because if you ask him, and so she goes and says, hey, can my sons, James and John, could they, like, in the kingdom, could they be the closest to you? It's just like, I can't tell you who's going to be closest. Now, here's the thing. If you're, as we saw on Sunday, if I'm in the balcony in heaven, I'm still going to be as close as everybody else. And I'm going to feel as close as everybody else. And, and yet the one that's there, they're going to have bigger capacity, I think, to enjoy more stuff. But we can't compare one another because we're all individuals. And it's hard for our brains to comprehend. But there's got to be something in this principle that God reminds us that I'm coming back to bless you. So go back to the last verse of Hebrews 7 or Hebrews 9, verse 28. Because he said in verse 27, we're going to die. You know you're going to die. Be prepared to die. He said, well, I don't think that's going to happen for another 30 years. We don't know. What it's, it could happen in the next 30 minutes. We don't know. He says, be prepared for death. Because one day you're going to stand before a holy God and he will judge you. We don't know all the ramifications of that. If you're genuinely saved, you get heaven. If you're not saved, you get hell. Forever and ever and ever. But he died and he asked me to serve him. Verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that Look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. But the truth, when he comes back, every child of God gets to go to heaven. We're going to see him face to face. We're going to enjoy the blessings of heaven. Nobody's going to have any sickness, sorrow, tears, nothing. It's going to be perfect. There's something about capacity. No comparison, but there's something about capacity that we get, which is why heaven is God wanting to bring that to earth today. He wants me to let him rule and reign in my heart to put him first. Go to just a few more pages over. James chapter 4. Paul wrote, James writing to the believers there. James chapter 4. He says this, go to now, verse 13, go to now, you that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and gain, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. 
For what is your life? It's a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him is sin. When you know what you should be doing with your life and we don't do it, it's sin. And so God reminds us and God encourages us, I want you to wait for me. Prepare for me. Look toward the heavens and get ready for heaven. And think about how we're living our life today. In first, we don't go to the first Thessalonians chapter one, that whole passage, it talks about the, the church at Thessalonians. They got saved, they got excited, they started serving God. And at the end of that, in verse 10, it talks about them waiting for his son, waiting for Christ. Why were they so faithful? Because they, they had their eye toward heaven. It's what we're talking about in Sunday school. Colossians three, keeping your eye on heaven, preparing for it. So think about your Christian walk right now, today. How big is your measurement cup? In your service to him as you live for God, which one are you choosing every day as you get up? Are you choosing something like this, or are you pouring your heart and your life into something much, much bigger? And then praying all the time, Lord, give me a bigger cup that I can continue to invest my life into you. One day we will all be face to face with Christ. It in a hundred years, we're all going to be there. But what about the next hundred days? We have no idea what the next week, the next year has in store for all of us. We will all be before God. We will all spend eternity somewhere. I hope we're all going to heaven. If you're not sure, please talk to somebody today. Make sure. But if you are going to heaven, how big is your cup that you're investing in your eternal blessings that God can one day richly pour back on you for all eternity.